Thank you for coming. We appreciate you attending the Nutritional Frontiers Professional Training Event on getting your PhD in pH. My name is Jamie Dorley. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nutritional Frontiers. And as many as you know, Nutritional Frontiers is a Pittsburgh-based wellness company that just recently moved to Bridgeville, South Fayette, PA. So if you're ever in the area, right on Washington Pike, come on in and visit the new facility. So Nutritional Frontiers helps doctors like yourself, healthcare professionals, and patients worldwide implement wellness in their business and lives. And the reason we do this for Nutritional Frontiers is we want to make the world healthy again, right? So we have a fantastic day planned for you. So I'm going to give you a quick agenda and we'll jump right into the training event. This is an interactive participation is necessary and mandatory for everybody. I think you have a lot of fun. And this is one of the events that you can learn things that you can implement today in your practice, right? Because many times you go to events and maybe you can't. So the agenda is we're going to start from 10 o'clock right now, go to about 12 noon with part one. So we're going to do pH of the saliva. At 12, we're going to take lunch, which is right down the hallway. Free healthy lunch provided. There is vegetarian options for you. We'll start back about 1 o'clock, and it'll go from 1 to 3 with urine pH. If Tracy thinks she needs a break in the morning or afternoon, she'll let us know, okay? So we've been really lucky to work with this doctor. She has a fantastic practice. She's a naturopath by trade and training, and she actually trains a lot of other people interested in, in natural health, naturopathic, and I've gone through this seminar already, and I thought it was fantastic. You're going to learn a lot, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the topic of pH, and she's going to clear those up for us today. So let's give a nice warm welcome to Dr. Tracy Strout. So my name is Tracy Straub. I'm from central Pennsylvania, uh, Altoona, actually. Is anybody familiar with there? Yeah? Okay. So we have a practice in Tyrone, which is in between uh, Altoona and State College. My background is actually in exercise and sports science. Uh, that was where I attained my degree, was Penn State University, and I did personal training for about 15 years. And I noticed through that, that that is probably the biggest trend in weight loss, biggest trend in health. When someone says, I want to get healthy, they don't think, well, I'm going to go see my PCP, right? They don't say, oh, I'm going to go see my ND or my chiropractor to get on the best track to health. No, they go hire a personal trainer. And so they go in and they work out and that's the stem of health. What I had found was there wasn't a lot of nutritional education in that particular field when I was in it. Now you're talking 15 years ago. It has come up a lot. The other thing that I found was that people weren't losing weight the way they should because we weren't looking at the whole person, right? So that is my story into ND naturopathic. I also had a very, very severe allergy baby which I had to completely fix his entire gut in order for him to overcome that. So when I started it as an ND, I went back to Trinity, which is a school in Indiana. I now am a core instructor for that particular uh, educational platform. And we were just talking here earlier, there'll be a big announcement in August for Trinity School of Natural Health, so stay tuned. Today, we're gonna to talk about pH, and I am a hand talker, so I'm gonna tell you how difficult it is for me to hold this microphone <laughs> and not talk with my hands. How many people are familiar with pH testing or pH in general? Does anyone here use it in their practice? Okay, well, yes, I know you guys do. This is my staff, they're like, us, oh, yes, I know. <laughs> So I think there are a lot of misconceptions with pH. I will tell you, if you walk out of this lecture and this is what resonates with you, wonderful. If you walk out of this lecture and it does not, it's really okay. But for today, let's keep an open mind. Let's try to learn something, something new, and maybe something that you can implement, okay? I'd like to say thank you to everyone that's here. I know I've attended these lectures. I know you're taking time out of your day, and I wanna tell you I appreciate it. I want to thank Mike, my rep, and Jamie, of course, and all the staff for having me here. I really appreciate you guys. So, pH. First, we have to start with our little disclaimer so that everybody knows that I'm not a licensed practitioner and that this information is just for fun. Moving on. All right. <laughs> so, when we talk about pH, this is like a 400-foot cord. We're talking about potential hydrogen, 
okay? We're talking about how many positive ion or hydrogen ions are within. I do understand it's a figure of expressing acidity and alkalinity, okay? It's a logarithmic scale, which I'll explain what that means, okay? So when we're looking at a scale of one to seven, this particular area is neutral. Anything beyond seven is considered what? Alkaline, right? And anything less than seven is considered what? Acidic. Remember, this is interactive. You get bonus points. So there is a lower concentration of hydrogen in the alkaline scale, correct? Because it's more hydroxide. And on the acidic scale, we have a higher concentration, more hydrogen. So this is basically how we all learn chemistry. And I know right now everyone's having nightmares of fourth grade. Going, oh my gosh, don't throw up the periodic table of elements. That's next. No, I'm kidding, we're not doing that. So when I say it's a logarithmic scale, this is actually one of the most powerful things I try to point out to my actual clients. That each little line here is 10 times. So if you go from a pH of seven, neutral, to six, it's 10 times more acidic. If you go to five, it's 100 times more acidic. If you go to four, it's 1,000 times. So it's a logarithmic scale of, of a 10 times value. So it can make a substantial difference when you have a pH of five compared to a pH of six, okay? All right, so we're gonna forget everything I just said, and we're gonna learn pH on how I do it. And I learned from a system called RBTI. Is anybody familiar with Rehm's biological theory of ionization? You're familiar with it? You're familiar with it. Okay, great. Dr. Kerry Reams was an agriculturist. He was a chemist. And basically what he found over 20 years of studies is that the pH of the body is responsible for a couple of things which we're gonna learn today. pH is only one part of the RBTI system. When I do this system, I'm looking at carbohydrate level of the body, how well you assimilate sugars, how well your body can process those sugars into energy. I look at pH. I also look at salt levels of the body, conductivity, if they're too high or too low. And I look at organs of detox, how well your body can eliminate. If all systems are go, you are in good health. If they're not, then we have an issue and we have to correct those. The pH is actually the core part of this testing system because it tells me about digestive health. And at the very bare minimum, you can have hormone imbalance, you can have sleep disorders, you can have all kinds of different disease of the body. But if you're not putting nutrient dense food into your body and assimilating it and releasing toxins, you're not gonna be healthy, okay? So it truly is, we are what we eat. And so today we're going to talk about the foundations of health and what that means. And we're going to talk about pH. So this is where people get confused. Optimal pH and what I practice is 6.4 over 6.4. That's optimal. Is that alkaline or acidic according to the pH logarithmic scale? It's acidic. Oh my gosh. What now? <laughs> right? So what's the big famous quote you hear flying around the internet about alkalinity? Cancer can't survive in a alkaline environment. We're gonna get to that quote, okay? It's wrong, it's quoted wrong, and it's not what he won the Nobel Prize for. So we're gonna, I'm gonna dissect that as well. Represents digestion, transit time of digestion. So when we test, your pH today, which we're all gonna test. So right now, I want everybody to take a drink of water, cleanse your mouth and swallow, okay? Remember, this is interactive. Okay, now that you've done that, you're not allowed to drink anything for 15 minutes. You're welcome. That's right, everyone's looking at their clock, like how long do I have? It's gonna be the longest 15 minutes of your life, I get it. Try to just refrain from drinking. Because what we're gonna do is test your saliva pH, and then if you want to, during lunch, everyone's gonna receive pH strips in a cup, and we're gonna test your urine as well. It's optional, you don't have to do it. Please don't bring it back here. <laughs> right? Okay. All right, so we're gonna keep everything clean and pretty today. All right, so what does 
pH represent? Transit time. How fast or slow your digestion is. And how fast or slow your digestion is actually determines whether or not you can assimilate nutrients at the right time and if you can detoxify your body. Okay? And we're going to learn all about that today. This also is indicative of mineral acceptance. Does everybody have a mineral acceptance chart? Bill, you're going to be my victim today Great. because you're right in front. Thanks, or volunteer, I mean. Yeah. Yes, that's what I meant to say. This chart, mineral acceptance. Does everyone see that? So we're going to be utilizing that chart today to understand how pH will affect not only how fast or slow your digestion is moving, but how many minerals you're actually accepting. How many physicians will tell you, don't take a multivitamin because it just ends up in your urine anyway, right? There's been research studies on it, hasn't it? My question always is, what was their pH? What's the most specific nutrient on that page? Can you see that? You guys aren't allowed to answer. Quiet in the front. So if you look at that pH, at what pH can you receive all the nutrients on the left? 6.4, correct? What's the most specific? Iodine. Do we have a thyroid issue in this country? Could it possibly be that we're in the wrong pH? Okay. So for me, when I learned about pH, this transformed my practice because the supplements and the protocols and everything I was doing that I knew I was doing right sometimes didn't work. And so I would say, why? And I would then test pH. And I would realize they were either super acidic or super alkaline or had a split pH. And we're going to learn about all those patterns today. So when we write this, when you graph your own saliva, can everybody see this bottom one? Here, I'll just pull it up. When you graph your own, we always write your pH numbers, urine over saliva, whatever they are, and we're going to test that. Okay? The reason we put saliva on the bottom is because it's most important. So it's heavier, it's denser. And that'll get confusing later. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll try to clear it up. All right, so Reem's biological theory of ionization. According to his scale, 6.4 is optimal. That's where we want to be, urine over saliva. We want the digestive system moving at the same speed, top and bottom. Right? If you are beyond 6.4, so I want you to remember for today, in regards to pH that we are discussing with RBTI, if you are beyond 6.4, I am now blind. You are, too, you are what? Alkaline, right? Too slow. Things are moving too slow. And if you are less than 6.4, things are moving too fast. This will also mean low mineral acceptance on both sides of the spectrum. It doesn't matter if you're too slow or too fast, your body is starving for nutrients. It's either waiting for them or it can't catch them, okay? It's like a three-year-old and your grandmother. If they're moving at two different speeds, so my grandmother's 94, okay? She still gets around, she has a walker, and I have a three-year-old son. Try going someplace with them. Uh-huh, you got one sprinting, and the other one's like, and I'm coming, and I'm like, I'm the mineral. I'm like, I'm over here, and I'm gonna go over there. Okay, I'm just, so you have, your body will make a decision, or it won't, or I'll just sit down and say, forget it. You're on your own, both of you. <laughs> So keep in mind that your body has to run at the same speed. You need processes going at the same rate so that when things go in, they should come out, okay? All right, so what we're going to do is now collect your saliva. Do we have little saliva cups at their stations? Yeah, that can, just I got you on your toes. Hurry up! <laughs> so this is the attractive part where everybody gets to spit into a cup in front of everybody else. You're welcome. So what we're going to do is actually swallow to cleanse the palate. Okay, so just swallow once. And then you're going to work up saliva. And we have these little, depending on what you want to call them. Last night I said jello shots. He said communion cups. I said that tells you a lot about our backgrounds. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that's totally what I meant. Uh -huh, communion cup. So inside the cup is a pH strip. Do not spit on the pH strip. So let me give you instructions. Thank you, Bill. Here I am again. 
I'm not going to, I'm not really going to spit in this. And if I do, I'll give you a new one. So you are going to work saliva up, spit into the cup and wait because we need pH meters for you to read it. When you take your pH strip, you're going to dip it into the cup quickly and pull it out and measure it immediately to the pH meter that's in front of you. So you're gonna wait until you get the pH meter, okay? Don't dip it now, and you can literally wait until that pH meter comes to you to actually do your saliva, okay? So don't dip and wait. It will oxidize, it will not be a true test, all right? So Candace is walking around handing out the cups. Thank you, ladies. Take note of anything that you see. You want to mark down your observations. So, hey, look, Bill, it's me again. Yeah, come on over. Here I am. He's like, why did I sit here? You didn't have a choice. Right? right? You didn't have a choice. I was like, sit That's there. True. Everybody have the sheet? Okay. This is where you're going to mark down your number for saliva. We will plot later. If you don't have the sheet, please put your hand up. We will get you one. It's just my staff. <laughs> we don't have one. So we want to make sure that everybody has this because this is where you can mark down your observations on the bottom of anything you see with your urine or saliva and to mark in your number for your saliva. Okay. What you're looking for with those observations are stringing. Does anybody know what a stringing saliva could indicate? Dehydration, absolutely. Okay, if you're dehydrated, can, what enzyme are you having a hard trouble producing in your mouth? Amylase, absolutely. Can that affect digestion? Yeah, digestion of what? Carbohydrates. In RBTI, when I measure sugars and I see really high sugars, Stringing saliva, I know that person's dehydrated. Can you have fluctuating sugar levels due to dehydration? Yeah, absolutely. One of the best things you can do for people that have unstable sugars is tell them to drink water. Okay? Right? It can't be that easy. No, no, it can't be that easy. You're right. They need a medication. That's right. I like this guy. <laughs> Yeah, well, Bill doesn't like them. <laughs> so when you're talking about observations, take note. If you see very thin saliva with no bubbling or any texture to it, what can that indicate? That can be low minerals, OK? They can have inactive salivary amylase. Either way, it's a digestive issue. Remember, it's all about balance, which is what RBTI is about. It's about balance. What are the two best ways in order to accept minerals in transit time of digestion? It was at 6.4. The same thing goes with our body. We don't want to be one extreme or the other. When I talk about pH and alkalinity, I kind of say it like this. There was some guy that was super acidic. He started to drink lemon water. He started to feel better. He wrote a book. And then he kept going. And probably today, he's on the other side, being too alkaline with all the same symptoms. But it's like every diet book or every nutrition book. Everybody pushes one way. There is no one way. That's why there's 5,000 books out there and not one, right? So when you get, is, are the pH meters going around as well? OK, so does everyone know how to measure? Putting the pressure on you. Hang on. I'm here. Okay. I don't know how long this cord is. Here is your pH meter. If you've never used a pH meter, you're simply going to dip that pH strip in and compare it to the color chart here and mark down the number. If your number is somewhere in between, mark the number in between, okay? Because these go from 5.5 .5 to 5.8. If you can't decide, write down 5.6, okay? So it's okay to be a little bit on and off. Okay, start spitting, start passing. You're up, girl. We're all watching you. I'm just kidding. We're not. <laughs> Drum roll, she's going. Okay, foundations. Last night I used the analogy, you cannot build a house on quicksand, okay? It will sink, no matter how many nails and boards and windows you put into it. If your foundation isn't solid, you're not gonna hold the numbers that you need to hold. So how many people here, when you see clients slash patients talk about diet, 
hydration, movement, elimination. How many people work on foundations? Okay. It is the key to what you want to do with your clients. Educate them. Doctor means teacher. That's the definition. Teach. So when I work with clients in PH, I work with nutrition, hydration, movement, sleep. And this is a big one. Do we have sleep issues in this country? I mean, we have whole facilities dedicated to sleep issues, correct? Right? What if I do everything right? What if I work out every day and eat all the nutritious food I can possibly eat and drink all my water? What if I can't sleep? Am I healthy? No, you feel terrible, right? I haven't slept for seven years. I have two kids. Like, it just doesn't happen. So, you know what I'm always supporting? Adrenals, sleep, <laughs> okay? Elimination, this is a big one. Uh, this is one of the ones that people talk about that their normal is once a week or once every three days. And I'll say, who told you that was normal? And they'll say, oh, I went and saw my you know, primary care and they said that's my normal. And I simply say, well, if you ate every three days, that would be normal. But you eat every day, a couple times a day, you need to eliminate every day. Stress and, stress and emotional wellness. How many uh, naturopathic practitioners do we have here? Anybody in the medical field? Okay. When you're in the medical field, one of the things that we see, which is integrating, is more of the stress and emotional wellness. I mean, they make lots of money telling you that stress causes heart attacks, correct? As a naturopath, I have to look at the whole person. I can't separate the physical from the emotional wellness. And so I look at how the body reacts to stress and emotions. So we're going to walk through each one of these. Nutrition. This is as difficult as I get with my clients right here. Tree ground run swim fly. That's it, non-GMO organic. If it falls from a tree, grows from the ground, runs in a field, swam in the ocean, or once flew in the sky, and it's non-GMO organic, eat it. Everything else is not food. Everything else is what you do instead of food, okay? If it can't reproduce on its own or germinate, it's not life sustaining. If it's not sustaining life in itself, it cannot sustain life in you. It's pretty simple. We have made this so difficult. High fat, low fat, keto, low carb, paleo. Good Lord. Figure out what works best for your client and have them do that. And you will be able to see on their pH whether what they're doing is working or not working. Okay? They have to be able to assimilate and eliminate. This is a big one. Digestive health in this country is terrible. Top four medications prescribed in this country are GI medications. Over 200,000 deaths per year are based on GI issues. That's huge. We're dying of digestion. Okay? So when you're looking at a client, you have to be able to understand, does this person actually break down the nutrients at the right time and eliminate them? 80-20 rule, how many people utilize this? 80% alkaline, 20% acidic, okay? This basically means we're a high stress country, we have high acidity, and we try to push towards alkaline. But alkaline food provides what to our bodies? Oxygen, right? It's one of the biggest ones, okay? Fix that person that's in your chair. You don't wanna give somebody the ketogenic diet if they don't need it, just because it's the latest fad. Okay, make sure that you're assessing that client, looking at what they're doing currently, and give them the appropriate nutrition. Because not every diet works for every body. Again, that's why there's 5,000 diet books and not just one. Balance and get your essentials. They're called essential nutrients, like essential fatty acids, because we can't make them. We're very fat deficient. But don't use coconut oil, because it'll kill you, right? Sponsored by the Canola Company. <laughs> Is canola oil natural? What is canola oil? Rapeseed, that sounds delicious. Yeah, genetically modified. It's actually nicknamed Canadian oil because that's where it came from. Right now, we use it to lube up our industrial parts because if we spill it on the ground, they don't have to report it to the EPA. It's a food. Huh, that worked well, okay. Usually if a country doesn't want it, they send it down here and we'll, we'll eat it. <laughs> send it in. Right? Correct the pH. If you correct the pH, 
you will absorb, assimilate, and eliminate everything that you're supposed to, okay? All right, hydration. How many people drink half their body weight in ounces in water a day in here? Yeah? Okay, remember, water is your medium for every process. You need to hydrate. Now, everyone's like, oh my gosh, she said distilled. <gasps> it's going to leach everything out of my body. If it's in your blood, it's not in your cells. It's not serving you. Okay, so when I use distilled water, I base this on energy potential. There's more energy potential in reverse osmosis and distilled than there is in tap because the frequency is bigger. It can expand more. There's more energy in the electrons. And really, you're just frequency. You're all just energy. Okay. So I will use RO water or distilled and balance pH with nutrition. Okay. Alkaline water. <clears throat> This is like a big fad, and people will say, should I drink alkaline water? Should you? Is alkaline water good? Nobody wants to talk now. <laughs> Everyone's like, she's gonna yell at me. I won't yell, I'll speak firmly, I'm a mom. Go ahead. Well, maybe for a little while, perfect answer. Just like every diet, maybe for a little while until you get the result you want, and then you should move into holding those numbers with full spectrum nutrition. Okay? Alkaline water is fine. I don't believe in alkaline your water with baking soda or things like that that can dilute out the hydrochloric acid of the digestive system. But I do believe that ionized alkalinization is fine for a period of time if you need it. Who would need alkaline water? Someone that's acidic, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, you can actually acquire water from raw fruits and vegetables. I get this question all the time. Do I have to drink that much? No, not if you eat it. Do you know what percentage of our food is bought from grocery stores that's processed? 90% of the foods bought in grocery stores are processed packaged foods. We throw away 40 million pounds of produce a year. That's disgusting in my book. Like, I, it was shocking when I saw those statistics. So it does help you understand why people need so much water to drink, basically because they're not eating it. But if you can teach them to do that, it'll be fine. Low hydration will affect pH. And I had a gentleman over here said, if you're dehydrated, you're not gonna produce salivary amylase. That's absolutely true. And you will be able to see that in saliva pH. You will also know deficiencies that they'll carry from acidic pHs, okay? And we're gonna cover all of those. Movement. I was a personal trainer for 15 years. I sold this, breathed this, and did this. The worst crime that I see today is they actually think exercise is to burn calories to lose weight. It's wrong. 80% or more of our country is overweight. Do you know how many people in this country work out? Over 80%. <laughs> is it working? You? Okay. What changed over the last 70 years was our food sources. The food sources changed the microbiome of the gut. The gut changed the enzymatic action of the body and destroyed the secondary metabolic functions. That's a whole other lecture. I'm not talking about it today, but that's a whole other thing that I teach. Calories. They matter, and yes, it's friction. You're gonna burn calories when you exercise, but it's not why you lose weight. Fat does not encapsulate calories. It encapsulates what? Toxins, right. So what happens when you start to burn fat, when you start to release the toxins, when you start to move, which is what your body requires to detox? It has to move, okay? So when you start to burn fat and you're detoxing that those toxins into the bloodstream, what happens to people after a while? Start to lose weight and then what happens? They stop, they plateau. What happened? They didn't change anything. They're still working out, They're still eating the same, still doing the movements, right? Did their body just be like, well, you know, I'm done, forget it. What happens is all those toxins get released into the blood and their organs of detox or their pathways get congested and they don't help with any type of nutrients to get the toxins out, to help those organs of detox rebuild because they get overwhelmed, right? Sweating, 
You ever hear people say, I don't sweat, I glisten. <laughs> I sweat, I'm a head sweater. Sweating's a normal proce process of detox. Your body is trying to get salts out, get things out, get toxins out. Is your skin an organ of detox? Yes. Does it absorb? Absolutely. It's one of your biggest organs that absorb everything. Most of your absorption occurs on your feet. Okay? So think about that when you're Cloroxing your kitchen floor and walking on it with your bare feet. Lymphatic system. This only moves if you move it. Where's the lymphatic system? All over. Everywhere. Right? And if it's stagnant, you're not detoxifying. In Chinese medicine, what does stagnation mean? Death. Stagnation is death. We do not want stagnation, okay? Cumulative, rather. I'm not really sure where the concept of going to the gym for one hour and sitting for 23 hours a day really came. I don't get it. So for 23 hours, we don't have to move. And for one hour a day, we have to murder our bodies <laughs> with P90X, and that is health. Now, you have to move throughout the day. You have to stimulate the lymphatic system. So everybody stand up. We're doing jumping jacks. No, I'm kidding, we're not, but stand up. <laughs> I'm kidding, I wouldn't make you do that. Let's do burpees. Let's do burpees, <laughs> wrong. All right, so this is a really easy process that I teach my kids, that if they have, you know, excess energy, that's usually telling you you need to move. You ever hear somebody say, I just gotta move, I gotta get up. Usually it's a science in your body's going, hey, we need to detox something here, get up and move. So basically, hands at your side, okay, and all you're going to do is, on the toes, you're just going to start to shake. Okay? You're just going to move the lymph. If you do this two minutes a day, this is a great way to cellularly cleanse. You're going to energize your whole system. And it's really going to tell you where you need the tone at the gym, doesn't it? It's like, <laughs> wow, that's really shaking. I didn't know that shook so much. Okay? So this is just a great way to move the lymphatic system. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. You guys are energized. Two minutes. Do you have two minutes in the morning? Could you do that while you're blow drying your hair? Okay, not you, but anybody, <laughs> anybody else. So, accumulate that movement through the day. Get up, walk, shake, do something where you're moving that metabolic system, that you're getting the lymphatic system to move. Clients with limited mobility, this is a big one because they're not moving, okay? So I know there's some chiropractors here, correct? All right. You can have someone come in, they're not moving, they can't move, they have lower back, they have something wrong. There's all different types of ways to help them detoxify. How many people do dry skin brushing here? Does anybody know what that is? So dry skin brushing is an excellent way to move that lymphatic system. You always want to start from lower extremities towards the heart, from the appendages, fingers, towards the heart. You're always brushing in. And basically you can take a back scrubber, you can take a hard loofah, and you're going to do quick circular motions on your skin, naked. Now, I've demonstrated, but it just gets awkward. <laughs> um, so you want to brush the skin up towards the heart, left leg, right leg, left arm, right long arm, do the belly, do up the back. Okay. For women, do around the breast tissue. There is a lot of lymphatic here. Okay. You need to cleanse that out. It'll take you approximately two minutes before you get into the shower to do some dry skin brushing. And for somebody that can't move, this is excellent because it really invigorates them. It helps open the pores on the skin, and then you can get into the shower or tub and help detoxify the body. Okay? There's no wrong way to do it, but I always say brush towards. Brush towards the heart. That's where the venous return happens. Okay? Yes? Poor skin integrity, I would recommend something else in them, or a softer brush. Like you can use like a little loofah sponge, you're still gonna get, or just literally taking your hand and, and moving the lymph. It's right under the skin, okay? When you do about two or three minutes of dry skin brushing, it's equivalent to a five mile walk in detoxification. It's pretty powerful for somebody who can't move. Now that's not calorie burning, it's basically lymphatic cleansing. Okay, 
So infrared saunas would work great for somebody that has skin integrity problems because the red light would be a great healing spectrum. It would also help them sweat and detoxify. Lymphatic massage might be well. But can they just shake? Could they do this, right? Ever see kids, what do they do? They jump, they jump, they jump. I usually tell my mommies that have children with allergies or sinus issues, that's lymphatic congestion. I tell them, go get them a little mini trampoline with a safety handle and let them jump every day a few minutes. Okay, get that lymphatic moving. Sleep, seven to nine hours of uninterrupted sleep is recommended. How many people here sleep through the night solid and don't wake up even to use the restroom? All right, good sleepers. Okay, if you are getting up at night to use the restroom, your body is not detoxifying adequately through the day. Okay, it's not normal to wake up. And I'll have people say, well, I don't want to drink too much water because then I get up all night. That tells me that one of their pathways are congested and I need to work on that. Okay? This is the prime time for your body to recover and repair. This is crucial. We, we release growth hormone. We actually have new thought processes that are formed. We let go of emotional stress. We dream. Okay? Sleep issues can indicate stress on particular systems. How many people know the Chinese meridian wheel or what's called the qi wheel? I know you guys do, right? Awesome. When I ask people if they have sleep issues and they say, well, I wake up between one and three, then I know that we have some liver congestion. I also know they might be angry about something, right? Because liver in Chinese medicine is anger. What are kidneys? Fear. What's gallbladder? Resentment. resentment. Yeah, frustration, resentment. Lungs? Grief. Grief. Yep. So when I look at a person, simply asking, well, what time do you get up to use the bathroom? Can tell me a lot about the system of elimination that needs supported. Okay. Adrenal fatigue. These are the people who say, huh, I put my head down on that pillow and I'm out. Or they'll tell me they wake up all night long. I wake up at one, I wake up at two, I wake up at three. Those are your adrenal fatigues, okay? So pay attention to what your clients say in order to help them better, okay? How many people have a smartphone? How many people still have a dumb phone? No? So on your smartphone, does, do you have your iPhones? Anybody have an iPhone? Apple, iPhone? Okay, if you do, do you know about your night shift option on this? everybody know? So if you want, grab your phone, okay? You're allowed to take it out for 10 seconds. And you're gonna swipe up from the bottom like this, okay? And there's an option that says night shift. If you click that, it's gonna turn your screen from this blue to orange, okay? Why would I wanna do that? What do blue screens do to my pineal gland? Right. It disrupts the production of melatonin in my system. What happens at night? The sun goes down, the light gets dimmer, the pineal gland goes, oh, it's time for bed. I'm gonna release melatonin and put this person to sleep. Then what do we do? We go in the house, we turn on every single light, the TV, and grab our iPhones and see how many likes we got on Facebook, right? That's what we do. So we're confusing our natural circadian rhythm. How many people do earthing here or understand what earthing is? Earthing is just a way to reset those circadian rhythms. You go outside, check when the sun is going down, okay? otherwise you'll be out there all night. Stand outside for at least three minutes and watch the sun set. Bare feet in the grass. When is the last time you touched something that was alive besides a person? So we get up out of our square bed in our square room, and we get in our square car, and we drive to our square office, and we never touch anything living. We're under fluorescent lights all day, and we wonder why we have sleep and stress problems, okay? Connect with the earth. Have something living in your house besides yourself. Plants, animals, those are all grounding mechanisms. You can touch a plant before you go to bed and reconnect some circadian rhythms. Salt lamps, okay? But earthing can be very powerful. Tachyons EMF blockers, this is an EMF blocker. Okay, remember your electromagnetic frequencies. They're frequencies, they're gonna interfere with your frequencies. So when you're talking to clients, ask, what are you doing before bed? 
oh, I'm reading on my Kindle. How about a book? <laughs> and watch how quickly they fall asleep, right? I know if I'm reading on my iPad, I totally can read chapter after chapter because my body's like, oh, look at this big, bright, shiny light. I'm totally awake. I pick up a book, I'm in four sentences, and I'm gone. It takes me at least a year to get through a book. Like, I cannot read a book. <laughs> Everyone's like, do you read that book? I'm like, yep, still reading it from, you know, 2015. It's awesome. So here's that Chinese meridian wheel we were talking about, or your chi wheel. And as you can see, each part indicates times that you could wake up in stress. And we have a yin and a yang. Uh, you know, we have balance, and that's what Chinese medicine is all about. So we're talking about the gallbladder. If someone says, you know, 11 o'clock hits and I just get the second wind and I can't fall asleep, then I know we have some gallbladder congestion. There was a question yesterday when I was talking about this. They said, well, what if you get tired during the day? I would ask when, you know? When do we get tired most? After we eat what? Lunch. Hmm. Small intestine, one to three. Aren't those most of the time some people are like, Rrr. and so what do you grab that satisfies? Snicker, that's the answer. No, that's not the answer. Okay. But between one and three, what does the small intestine do for us? It assimilates our nutrients, right? We need that. So if you are having congestion in that area or energy loss, are you going to feel energized? No, you're going to feel tired. Okay. So when you're looking at this wheel and you're looking at clients, Pay attention to what they say, because it can tell you a lot about the elimination pathways. So let's talk about elimination. Bowels, urinary, lungs, lymph, skin. We call these the bowls. And they're called the bowls because if you know a bowl, they matter, okay? They rush in, they charge everything, they get your attention. Imagine this as a highway. So if you drive in Pennsylvania, you could have construction in the bowels, construction in the urine, construction in the lymphatic, and now you're down to two lanes, correct? Because no matter where you drive in Pennsylvania, there's construction. So let's talk about bowel movements. Liver and gallbladder and colon. What's the number one surgery? Gallbladder, gallbladder removal. Does that person now have a compromised elimination pathway? Yep, now they're not breaking down proteins, they're not breaking down fats, they're not alkaline the chyme that's coming out of the stomach. Now we have issues. Urinary, bladder and kidney. What does that have to do with? What did the kidneys love? Water, right? How many people are dehydrated? When I said how many people drink half their body weight in ounces a day, I saw about five or six hands. Do you think this pathway for you is congested if you're dehydrated? Absolutely. What about lungs? Anybody ever watch a baby sleep? Joe made such a good comment yesterday at the lecture. Has anyone ever seen a baby sleep? What rises? Their belly. They belly breathe. Everyone take a deep breath. Oh, everyone's shoulders went up. Okay, now everybody keep your shoulders still and take a deep breath. <laughs> okay. You detoxify 80% of your toxins through your lungs. Now think about people with compromised breathing. Smokers. Is that pathway congested? Think about people who live in congested cities. Lymphatic system, we've talked about this one. This is a very easy one to congest because we don't move enough. And skin, remember, your skin is an organ of detox. It also absorbs. So if all of these pathways are open, your body can eliminate. If they're not, you're going to have congestion, and your body will tell you one way or the other. The issue is we don't pay attention to the screaming child. We don't take that first sign and pay attention. It's like my kids, they'll come in and say, Mommy, come into the living room. And I'll say, wait a minute. 10 minutes later, he comes back and he's like, I really need you to come in here. Just one second. And then there's a major crash and I'm running into the living room. Now it has my attention, right? The first sign may have been, well, I'm not having normal bowel movements every day. So now you have congestion in the colon, you have stagnation, you have toxins building up. The second sign is the lymphatic starts to get clogged because this elimination pathway is now reabsorbing waste products in, from the bowel into the lymphatic. Then they start getting sinus issues, and then they start developing a cough. And now you have three elimination pathways down. 
Later on, 15, 20 years of not paying attention to all those signs, they end up with some sort of polyp or encapsulated protein within the bowel system. Was the sign there? Was the screaming child telling them to come into the living room? Absolutely. But it wasn't until they heard the crash that they paid attention. So pay attention, okay? What they say is normal isn't always your normal. All right, so how many eliminations should we have a day? Bowel movements. Okay, right, two to three, healthy. And I usually tell my clients, pick your poop. Which side are you on? Type what? Okay, you guys don't have to tell me. In your head, you can tell yourself. On this side, what would this indicate if people were picking bowel movements here? Dehydration, yes. What about on the other side? Fat and protein assimilation. Okay, when I hear loose stools, I know we have an assimilation issue, primarily of fat. My very first question is, do you have all your parts or did they take your gallbladder? And they'll usually say, oh yeah, I lost my gallbladder two years ago. <laughs> like, well, you didn't lose it. You probably know where it is, but you, know, you just can't get it back. So this would be a client that I may suggest some enzymes with lipase or protease maybe even some bile salts. We have a good one called Betazyme, which is pretty good. Okay, stress and emotional wellness. We know this affects every part of our body. It affects blood pressure, it affects digestion, it affects the pH primarily. Anytime I see acid saliva and acid urine, I know that client is under stress of some sort. The thing is, when we hear stress and emotional wellness, we look at just the emotional when there actually can be some physical components to this. Think about your clients. They come in and they're doing the same thing over and over again and they expect you to create a different result. What is that called? Insanity, right? And what do they say when they don't get the result? That natural stuff doesn't work. I went there and it didn't help me, okay? Remember, physical stress can be food choices. Your body can actually react, and we were just talking about food intolerance tests and allergy tests. But keep in mind, your body's not reacting to food. It's reacting to what we do instead of food. It's reacting to things that are not food, right? Preservatives, chemicals, processing. How many people hear of gluten intolerance? <sighs> Suddenly, we're all allergic to gluten. It's a miracle, right? No. Could it be the chemicals we're spraying on the wheat? Could it be the fact that we take out the germ and the bran and we process it down and then we bleach it and then we eat it and now everybody needs to be gluten free? So then they go to the store and they buy gluten free everything and that works for a while and then all of a sudden they come in with the exact same problem. Is the problem the gluten or is it the problem that they're not eating enzymatic, whole, nutritious food? Okay, so keep in mind that physical stress doesn't just mean that something from the environment is doing it, but it can be something that they continually ingest and they're not telling you, okay? Also, emotional stress. I know with acupuncture and a lot of the other modalities that are in here, this is a big one. Anybody ever have a gut feeling? Okay, where'd that statement come from? Okay. Who knows who Christopher Reeves is? Superman, right? What did his wife die of a year after he passed away? Lung cancer. What are lungs? Grief. Grief. She never smoked. It's amazing. Okay. Don't forget your physical stress includes your EMF. Those phones are only tested for two hours of safety for electromagnetic frequencies. How many people only use their phone two hours a day? Come on. Okay, nobody. Right. Good. Well, good. Good for you. And we're going to take the class on that. She's next. Okay? That's awesome. If you really only use your computer or your phone two hours a day, great. You're farther ahead than most of us. And I can honestly admit, I don't. I use it more. Using your phone one hour, talking on it, decreases your salivary amylase by 25%. Will that affect your digestion? Yes. How many people talk on the phone, okay, all through the day and collectively get an hour? Okay, we've just offset digestion, we've offset pH. 
Don't forget about people. Anybody have those people in your life? They walk in and you're just like, oh, I know she's here, right? They can detract from your energy. They can increase your emotional stress. Guard yourself well. Okay, so how do we decrease it? Anybody use Bach flowers? Anybody know what they are? I love Bach flowers. Bach, Dr. Bach was a medical physician in the 30s. He found that if his clients slash patients, they were his patients, were emotionally well, they could get out of their own way and actually the modalities that he used would help them heal faster. Okay? Bach flowers are frequency. Frequency we know is powerful. What about homeopathy? Isn't that just frequency? How's that work? It's crazy, right? FDA approved. Energy modalities, Reiki, chakra balancing. Talk to your clients. Suggest therapy if they need it. Get rid of the stress. If you don't take care of the foundation, if you don't build these things, you're building a house on quicksand. Your pH isn't going to matter. No matter what you do is going to matter, and they're not going to blame themselves. They're going to blame you. Okay. Lifestyle modification, we talked about that definition of insanity, doing that same thing over and over again. Meditation, this is one of the biggest ones they're bringing into corporations because they can, they're understanding that if you can quiet the mind, you can heal. Okay. And cut negativity out of your life. That person that keeps coming into your office, just shut the door. <laughs> You're not available. All right, let's talk about balancing pH. So it's an accumulation of hydration, movement, detox, sleep, elimination, and managing stress. And yes, supplements are necessary, but supplements are meant to be supplemental. You're supposed to use them to help rebuild what you've lost and then take over with food. So they're going to assist in the nutrient density of the underlying issue to bring your body up to a point where it can heal itself. I'm a traditional naturopath. I can't cure, treat, or diagnose. Wink, wink. No, I'm just kidding. I can't. And I don't want to because I believe disease of the body is created. If you put your body in a poor environment, you will have poor health. If you put it in a nutrient-dense, hydrated, well-rested, emotionally balanced environment, you will be healthy. It's really that simple, and we like to make it very complicated. Okay? Don't play doctor with herbs. I can force move the body with lots of supplements. It's a way that we get a bad reputation. Teach your client what works for them. Okay? Does anybody do muscle response testing here? Okay, does anybody know how to tip test? We're gonna learn that today if you don't. We're gonna learn all of that. All right, how many people still need to do their saliva test? Everybody has their number? Okay, so saliva, let's get into what this means. This represents upper body digestion, mouth, esophagus, and stomach. I can tell a lot by a person's initial digestion just by their saliva. We already know it's indicative of salivary amylase, how hydrated we are. What else could we possibly see? Where does digestion begin? In the brain, exactly. It begins in the head. It starts with what you think about. So everybody think of a chocolatey rich brownie, okay? You start thinking about that and you think, oh, God, that sounds good, right? And so you start making saliva which kicks in the digestive process. So you go to grandma's house for that chocolatey rich brownie and she made peach cobbler. <laughs> is it different? Is that what you wanted? No. I used that analogy on Chipotle. We went to Chipotle once, that's what I really, really wanted, and it was closed. <clears throat> so I had to settle for something else. But the salivary amylase, the enzymes that I started to produce, the thinking process that I did, started for something else. So it starts here. What's the second part of digestion? Chewing, okay? What does chewing do? Does two things. Interactive, guys. I'm not standing up here by myself. That's right. It activates the brain to release enzymes and it breaks down the food so there's more surface area. So those enzymes can get there and break it down. How many times do you think you chew your food? How many times should you chew your food? Right? Another great comment by Joey is like, did you ever watch a kid eat? 
They sit there and they chew and they talk. And what do we say? Hurry up, eat, eat. We rush them. You should chew your food 20 to 50 times, depending on what you're eating, 20 to 30 is average. Today at lunch, count how many times you chew each bite. I'll guarantee you that most people will get through a whole meal and not chew 50 times, okay? So initially, we're not activating those enzymes. We're not kicking the body into gear. We're not adjusting so that our body can break down the food to a recognizable size, shape, and we're not activating the right enzymes for that food, okay? When we're writing this, we talked about, when we did our saliva pH, it's the bottom number, and because it's most important, Saliva pH provides me with tons of information, okay? Carbohydrate breakdown is one because of that amylase. B12 deficiency, why would I see B12? Why would I know if somebody has an acidic saliva, how do I know that B12 is not being produced well? That's right. It's made in the stomach. It's made in the fundus part of the stomach. So I know if it's running too fast, if that upper body digestion is running hot and fast, right, because that's what this indicates, it's too fast if the saliva is acidic. We don't even have time to produce B12, okay? K2, B12 and K2 are made with probiotics in the digestive system. That's where they come from. If we don't have a good microbiome, you do not produce enough B12 and K2. And K2s are what? He's our mailman, right? He delivers D3 and a lot of other good things where it's supposed to go. Do we have a D3 deficiency in this country? Are we eating probiotic-based fermented foods anymore? No. It's amazing, isn't it? Okay, collecting the saliva. When you do this for your clients, use a collection cup because it helps you with observation. Okay? You instruct them. Nothing in your mouth 20 to 15 to 20 minutes prior to the test. And be specific because they'll come in chewing their dentine. Okay? No gum, no mints, no water. Have a clean saliva catch. Instruct them to swallow once and then work up some saliva, spit into the cup, and then you can test it. I usually test it. I wear gloves. I don't know them. Okay? Note, if, note any discoloration. I've had people come in spit red. Okay, so what questions would I ask? Bleeding gums. Bleeding gums would be one, absolutely. What does bleeding gums tell me? Uh, Need for what? Vitamin C. vitamin C, right. Okay, so when we learn more about saliva, you'll know that that's actually an alkaline saliva, vitamin C deficiency. And you'll see that with blood, because if there's blood in it, it's going to make it more alkaline, right? Because blood runs at what? 7.35, it's more alkaline, okay? So there's a lot of things you can see in saliva. The other thing I ask is, do they have red dyes? Were they eating something, right? So ask questions, don't just assume, oh my God, she's bleeding. Like that may not be the case, okay? All right, urine pH. Urine is representative of the lower bodies. All right, so it represents small and large intestine. Again, this is gonna be written by the top number. So this represents lower body digestion. Again, we're looking at transit time, so we're looking at speed and mineral acceptance when we're talking about pH. We write it on the top, okay? And urine provides us with a lot of information. Colon congestion. If my pH of my lower body, my small intestine and large intestine, is alkaline, is it running too fast or too slow? What? <laughs> too slow, right? What's going to happen if my colon is running too slow? Am I going to be having normal bowel movements? Or what might you see in a client that has a slow colon? Constipation. Are they going to be reabsorbing waste products? What's going to happen 20 years down the road? Okay. So the other thing that I see with lower body pH is reproductive health with women. If I see an acidic pH, I know there's a need for manganese, okay? What is manganese referred to as? It's the love element, right? Dr. Reams actually said, if you, are, if you have enough manganese in your system, no deficiency, you cannot get cancer of the reproductive organs. That was his quote. Okay. 
It is one of the most vital things that I see in women. And when I see an acidic urine pH on a woman, I know that there's a reproductive issue and we need to address it. I can't diagnose anything, but I can absolutely give her nutrients and work with hormones and help her with her reproductive health. Okay, here's one of the things that I wanna talk about that this gets confusing on. When you test pH in regards to this system, we do not use the first morning void. It's a detox urine. Of course it's going to be acidic. Your body has just spent nine hours detoxifying. You're not gonna get real data. I normally suggest the most optimal time is one hour before a meal or two hours after. But this is the real world. I can't get people to always comply to this, so do the best you can. But ask your client, when was the last time you ate, so that you know. If they just ate a steak and a baked potato, and they come into your office a half an hour later, what may you see in the urine if their digestion is really fast? You might see a little acidity, right? So ask your clients, what do you eat typically on a day? It'll tell you a lot about their pH, okay? Make observations, clarity, is it clear? What if someone comes in with a super acid acid urine, but their urine is absolutely clear? Do you think that's good? Because we always tell people, like, your urine should be clear. Should be clear and run clear. It really shouldn't. Cell debris of urine is how your body detoxes. It tells me what's coming out. So if you are not healthy and not detoxing, we have an issue. Okay? I would more or less be more comfortable seeing somebody with a very poor pH, acid, acid, with a little bit of color to the urine. At least I know their body's trying to get rid of those bad cells. Okay? Notice if anything is floating in it. When you do your urine today, take a look at it, okay? You're all gonna be in it together, so don't worry. But look at it, is it cloudy? Is there anything floating in it? Look for things swimming in it. What could be swimming? Parasites. Parasites, yeah. They don't just come out in your feces. Okay? They're everywhere. So look at that urine. Use a light if you have to. Just don't bring it back here. We don't wanna see it, okay? So when you do the pH of your urine, when you do this in the bathroom, you will literally dip the pH paper into the urine and compare it immediately, then dispose of the urine in the cup, okay? Sound good? All right, so I'm gonna take questions. We can, if, does anybody need a break? Anybody have to go to the bathroom? Okay, good. So Candace, can we get cups? <laughs> Of course, Candace. I'm sorry, Candace. I don't know if I'm supposed to ask you. Tell me to ask Michaela. I can help you too. So if you want to do your urine collection, that's fine. You can do that now. Otherwise, I'll take questions for a little bit. Anybody have any questions about foundations, water, anything like that? All right, so when you collect your specimen, does anybody want gloves? I mean, it's yours, collect your own. <laughs> when you do this in your office, if you choose to do this, wear gloves. I've had people come in with hepatitis. I've had people come in with MRSA, okay? Be safe, be clean. You're not testing. You're basically taking a look for observations in pH. It's not a lab. We do use specimen cups in our practice with a lid, and I have people give the specimen in the restroom and leave it there because they will spill it when they're walking around with it. So I just have them leave it and then we go collect it. We test it, we dispose of it, and it's over, okay? So if you choose to do this in your practice, just keep clean with it, All right? Any questions on how to do this for yourself right now? Okay, so we're gonna take maybe a 10 minute break. We'll let people go to the bathroom. We'll have pH strips in the bathroom. Your meter's there, bring your cup out, test your pH, dispose of the urine, come back. No urine back in the room, okay?